Well, it's a great privilege to speak here this evening at the old meeting house on a little-known Christian leader from the, uh, the late 17th to the early um, 18th century. There's a sense in which uh, I could subtitle the lecture tonight, namely Calamy Celebrated, as a, a tale of three preachers, because three of them, in a sense, overlap. The first is Richard Baxter, the great Puritan, who lived from 1615 to 1691. And then the Christian leader whom I'm focusing particularly on tonight, Dr. Edmund Callamy, who was born in 1671 and died in 1732. And then the third preacher, Dr. Philip Doddridge, whom I've already mentioned, who was born in 1702 and died in 1751. These three lives uh, overlap in a most interesting way. And uh, I must admit that um, these three Englishmen have perhaps more than any others uh, influenced me in my Christian life and my understanding of uh, the Christian faith. So I'm grateful to the Lord for his providence in having uh, brought into my life uh, books by these wonderful men. And I'm here really tonight to share with you something of my discoveries. And I hope you'll be blessed in the short time we have, uh, as I have been blessed um, over uh, the years. Now, as by way of a very brief introduction, uh, is this a book launch? Well, yes and no. Uh, no in the sense that uh, the book I'm going to speak about uh, is this one here, Calamy Celebrated, the 350th anniversary of the birth of Dr. Edmund Calamy, the champion of nonconformity, a faithful servant of Jesus Christ in depressing times. This forgotten hero inspires hope in our dark days. So that is the book which was published uh, last year. But in a sense, it can be regarded as a, uh, a book launch because I'm going to present the story uh, of this great Christian man. And uh, more information is available uh, in the book it, itself. But of all the books that I've had the privilege of uh, publishing, uh, this one, in a sense, is unique in that it's the only book that I've ever published that has been requested by a publisher, publisher in North America, in actual fact. Uh, Professor Michael Haken, who has spoken in this uh, building on at least one occasion, and uh, the publishing company that produced the book is in Canada. So that makes it rather special that uh, I didn't have to push it, it was requested uh, for uh, publication. Now, perhaps the best way of uh, launching the book, and I don't feel entirely comfortable about launching my own book as such, but uh, I would like to allow the uh, British Church newspaper, in which a review recently appeared about this book, on the 4th of March uh, this year, uh, in the book review page, this is what it said, Calamy celebrated with the details given. God always re retains a faithful remnant in times of spiritual leanness. This is as true today as it was between the Puritan period of the 17th century and the Great Awakening under Wesley and Whitfield in the 18th. Such a member of the faithful remnant was Dr. Edmund Callamy, 1671 to 1732 described in this book both as the champion of nonconformity and a faithful servant of Jesus Christ in depressing times. Have you heard of him? Have you come across books that mention him? It is to bring his name to Christians' attention that this short book has been written to mark the 350th anniversary of his birth. And uh, it's only 48 pages, so it's quite brief. The review continues, he was associated in his earlier days with the renowned preacher Richard Baxter and 
it is asserted that he, perhaps more than any other preacher and theologian, transmitted Baxter's wonderful legacy to the 18th century and beyond. Yet how might the period be described in which Ad Edmund Callamy spent most of his ministry? It was a time when deism was increasingly popular with intellectuals, which held that all that could be known about God could be obtained from studying the created order. Thus it was the age when reason, rather than revelation of God through his infallible word, held sway. It was an age of the growth of Unitarianism, hyper-Calvinism, and latitudinarianism, described as broad convictions with little emotion. In short, it was a challenging age in which to live, work, and witness, rather like the present one. It was at such a time that Dr. Edmund Callamy sought to make the gospel known. The book traces his ancestry, his education, and his eventual conclusion as to which way to go, which was that of the Protestant dissenters rather than the Anglican Church. In 1694, he began a regular pastoral ministry in London of 38 years, as well as a career as an historian, and in addition, he helped to promote Richard Baxter's memory through publishing books such as Baxter's Practical Works in 1707 and works of his own, such as The Inspiration of the Holy Writings of the Old and New Testament in 1710. And at a time when Unitarianism was gaining ground, he published 13 sermons concerning the doctrine of the Trinity in 1722. The review concludes, Proverbs 10.7 says, The memory of the just is blessed, but it needs to be made known, which is what this short book sets out to do. Well, that, in a couple of minutes, is really, uh, it provides an introduction to the man that I hope to tell you a little more uh, about. Now, I'm very well aware, as I'm sure you're aware, that we're living at a time when the clouds of war have gathered over Europe. It's impossible for us not to pass through our days without thinking about this and hearing the news with great alarm, the horrific uh, events that are taking place right now in Ukraine. But in the time of Edmund Callamy, uh, there was war in Europe, in the first decade of the 18th century, there was a war called the War of the Spanish Succession, in which the Catholic powers of Europe, namely France and Spain, were threatening the northern Protestant nations of the Netherlands, Germany, and the United Kingdom. And it was in the providence of God that the Duke of Marlborough, Sir John Churchill, who, by the way, was an ancestor of Sir Winston Churchill, our great war leader during World War II. And uh, he had a, a sequence of spectacular military victories against the enemies of the uh, Protestant faith and of political liberty uh, in, in Europe. Louis XIV of France was the great threat at that time. He was a kind of French Catholic Putin we might say. So this was the news of the day in the first decade of the 18th century. And then in 1715 was the first of the Jacobite rebellions in which um, the Stuarts enabled, uh, 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 did their very best to uh, overthrow the Hanoverian Protestant monarchy the first of whom was, of course, King George I. And uh, in 1715 itself, there was a real sense of national alarm that we could have been invaded. Uh, so it was an anxious time uh, in London and in England at that particular time. Now, we should view that as the present war, as... Edmund Callamy would have viewed the wars of his day as but one symptom 
of the decadence that had swept over society from the late 17th century through into the uh, 18th century. We know that in the Word of God, the fourth chapter of the Epistle of James explains the origin of war. It is human corruption. It is our lusting after uh, material things and immorality uh, which tears us from the ways of God. And uh, this was a feature of society at that particular time in the late 17th century and the early uh, 18th uh, century. It was indeed a time of crisis. And I'm, uh, I'm afraid much of this uh, could be charged on the influence of King Charles II at the Restoration, who was a, a libertine. He was immoral. And he set the scene from the royal court down into society. Uh, it was a most uh, un ungodly uh, period. And this went on. And there was no real let-up in the decline of the spirituality and the values uh, of this country until the Methodist revival, which broke out under the blessing of God in the 1730s. Uh, to sum up this particular period, we may say that the cold wind of secularism, as we would call it uh, now, uh, humanism, God being banished from the scene and humanistic um, principles of reason and of human experience apart from the teaching of the Bible, uh, which had, of course, undergirded the Puritan uh, agenda in the time of Oliver Cromwell and Richard Baxter. So that's the situation in which Edmund Calamy was living and ministering and uh, writing. But there's a very real sense in which he was a champion raised up by God to witness for him to shine the light of God's truth at this very dark time. I've already mentioned, as the review did, that uh, Edmund Calamy uh, could be regarded as the champion of nonconformity uh, over against the persecution that the dissenters, the Protestant dissenters or nonconformists had been receiving from the Anglican authorities ever since uh, uh, the 24th of August 1662, the Act of Uniformity, which drove out around 2,000 godly Puritans from their livings. It was the most dark and distressing time. And uh, Edmund Calamy, as an historian, he wrote the accounts of the ejected ministers, and uh, his works are most inspiring and most informative uh, in, in this uh, regard. I say he was the champion of nonconformity, but by that time, uh, those called nonconformists were known in law as Protestant dissenters, because after the Act of Toleration of 1689, uh, it was now legal to be a non-Anglican, so they were called dissenters because they dissented under law from the Church of England uh, and its approach to uh, state uh, re religion. But uh, Edmund Calamy was also a champion of Protestantism because a Protestant dissenter was a Protestant, believing in the truth of the Reformation, sparked off by Martin Luther in 1517. And all that is best in the British Isles really was the fruit of the mighty work of God, the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century, not only religiously but also politically. Uh, because wherever Roman Catholicism uh, was uppermost, there was a tyranny over the bodies as well as the souls of men. And there was a spirit of liberty through the gospel and also in social and public relationships. And this was under threat, it always has been, but certainly uh, increasingly in the time of uh, Edmund uh, Calamy. But at the very deepest level, I could describe him as a champion of Christianity, because Christianity was really being challenged uh, at its very basic uh, level. 
And uh, in 1715, Edmund Callamy, he preached and published a number of sermons on the security of Christ's church. This is to do with the Jacobite rebellion, this sense of alarm across the nation uh, that there could be a, a Roman Catholic uh, invasion and uh, overturning of our Protestant constitution. So he was very concerned to defend the Christian faith uh, in every aspect. He was therefore a champion who was raised up by God. Let's consider just a little more of his background. He had a Huguenot ancestry. In other words, descendants of the French Reformed churches who under the influence of John Calvin in Geneva had had such a courageous testimony for around three centuries in France being persecuted by the, the Roman Catholics in a most merciless manner for a long period of time. Well, his, his ancestors, Calamy's ancestors, uh, escaped to this country uh, after the Bartholomew Massacre of 1572. And uh, they became, of course, English nonconformists. And Edmund's uh, father and his grandfather were both ejected as Puritans in the year 1662. I believe that the picture which uh, our brother John placed on the website for tonight's meeting uh, is actually the picture of Edmund I. But you'll get a proper portrait of my Edmund tonight from uh, the book. There were actually four Edmunds. Our Edmund tonight is Edmund number three. And then he, after his marriage, uh, he had a son whom he also named Edmund. So, so in the literature, you can easily get confused about which Edmund you're on about when you mention Edmund Calamy. So we're referring to Dr. Edmund Calamy. His early education uh, was undertaken in various uh, uh, dissenting academies uh, in London, run by, by ministers. And during this time, he came to a living faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, at that time, uh, Protestant dissenters weren't allowed to attend Oxford or Cambridge universities. You had to be an Anglican to qualify to go to university. So very often the uh, Protestant nonconformists or dissenters, they traveled to the Netherlands to receive a higher education. And so Edmund went to Utrecht and received his higher theological education uh, in that city. So yes, he studied in the Netherlands. And then he returned after the accession of William III and Queen Mary, William of Orange, who came to deliver us from the, the threat posed by King James II in 1688, the glorious revolution uh, as we know it. Uh, Edmund Calamy became a pastor and a historian of the ejected clergy, as I've already touched upon. His church was at Princess Street, Westminster. He was a Presbyterian uh, minister but uh, I would have to say a, a moderate Presbyterian in the sense that um, he still viewed the Congregationalists and the Baptists as brothers in the gospel despite their relatively insignificant differences. They were Bible-based believers in the everlasting gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Edmund Calamy was very concerned about the low spiritual health of the churches. And this really uh, needs to be kept in mind because the Church of England had become dead. This latitudinarianism that I mentioned uh, was mentioned in the review. And uh, the fire of the gospel had gone very largely. Christianity was something respectable uh, and largely for the upper classes. But then, amongst the dissenters themselves, 
many of the Presbyterians were being influenced by rationalism and they were drifting into Unitarian teaching which denied the blessed trinity of God as Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And then there was the growth of hyper-Calvinism when many of the dissenters, they became more extreme in their overreaction to Arminianism to a form of hyper-Calvinism which John Calvin would never have recognized as his his offspring. And there was a lot of sectarianism too. Uh, so there was a lack of unity all too often among those who had a very f fundamental foundation uh, in the word of God. So there was a great deal of concern. If you were a Christian and you believed in God and you believed the gospel, you would survey the life of the churches and be, be very depressed because things were not as they should have been. But in this context, Edmund Calamy was a faithful warrior. He was a solid soldier of Christ at a time when depression was in the air. I mentioned the uh, debate between Arminianism and Calvinism. That had been a running sore right the way through the 17th century. Richard Baxter did his best to make sense of all that the Bible taught about the things that these two positions were claiming uh, were, were true. And uh, one may say that uh, Edmund Calamy, he faced this issue head on and he dealt with it. He put the issue to bed, if you like, in a very marvelous sermon lecture published in 1703, which was the year John Wesley was born, uh, called Divine Mercy Exalted. And uh, what he argues from the scriptures in a very careful, balanced exegesis that we must uh, uh, stress the universality of the gospel alongside the sovereignty of God in the gospel. And he presents the case in a very clear and cogent manner, uh, solving so many of the questions that had remained unsolved, in a sense, uh, up until the death of Richard Baxter in 1691. Calamy actually heard uh, Richard Baxter preaching and had conversation with the great Puritan before he passed uh, to his everlasting rest. The problem really was that so-called Calvinism wasn't really John Calvin's teaching. It was a more extreme version following the views of the Puritan theologian Dr. John Owen. And one may coin the expression Owenism. And that was the polarization between the two uh, views that Richard Baxter sought to bring together, not only on the basis of the Bible, but actually reaffirming what Calvin actually said, which very few people have even read. There we are. That was what uh, Elemy, uh, uh, Edmund Calamy did in 1703. It became known as the Baxterian Middle Way and is rooted in honest biblical exegesis, avoiding imbalanced emphases on truths that are clearly revealed in the Word of God. In 1696, uh, Edmund Calamy had helped Matthew Sylvester in the publication of Richard Baxter's autobiography. And uh, Calamy was responsible for drawing up the index to that uh, rather monumental um, folio. But then, in seven, in, and then in 1707, Calamy gathered together the greatest uh, practical works or treatises of Richard Baxter and published Richard Baxter's Practical Works, 1707. And then three years later, he preached a number of sermons uh, on the inspiration of the Bible. And uh, part of the motivation for these sermons was that uh, the Bible's inspiration was being under attack from a group of people known as the French Prophets, some of the Huguenots uh, 
had been driven to great desperation in the south of France, and they were giving way to a certain kind of fanaticism, which uh, the best way I can describe it to you is that it was a kind of charismatic fanaticism uh, of the kind that's uh, too common in our own day. Uh, charismania, I think it could be called, where there's more of an emphasis upon uh, the latest spirit revela revelation, um, what you think and what you feel, and the temptation to lay aside the written word so that um, the latest revelation must be listened to and the word of God is not preached as it should be, as the infallible, uh, or sufficient uh, and authoritative word of God. So this was making many people doubt the integrity of the Bible. So Edmund Callamy preached a, a marvelous set of sermons, uh, and um, that was published in 1710. And I have an original copy of that set of sermons, and they're absolutely marvelous. And uh, if you come across people who say, well, there are contradictions in the Bible, and that could never have happened, and that could never have happened, and so on and so forth, but all those old chestnuts, so to speak, that still people bandy about and use that as the basis for rejecting the Christian faith. Well, Calamy faced all these head-on. There's nothing new under the sun, you see. And uh, he answered all their objections and uh, leaves you with the great feeling that when you open your Bible, you may be fully assured this is the divinely inspired word of the living God, of the loving God and that you may trust what you read without being troubled by the critics of the scriptures. And then the other cause that uh, Edmund Calamy uh, championed was concerning the, the doctrine of the Trinity. Unitarianism was, was rife in dissenting circles and also among some leading Anglican theologians. And uh, there was a great attack upon the Trinity at the heart of which it was an attack on the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, up until that time, faithful Bible-believing Christians believed that our Lord Jesus was God manifest in the flesh, as Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3.16, that he is the invisible God clothed in visibility. He is our God contracted to a span, incomprehensibly made man, as Charles Wesley was later on uh, to write. So it is so important because the, the deity, the Godhood of our Lord Jesus Christ is fundamental to the gospel. He was God and man in one person. And uh, all that was being uh, rejected by rationalistic Unitarianism. And what they were really doing was reaffirming the kind of uh, heresies that had sprung up in uh, the Middle East uh, in, in, through uh, Islam. Islam is an enemy of the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. They insult him, they blaspheme him by saying that Jesus was a prophet, uh, even inferior to Muhammad. Well, it's shocking blasphemy. Well, the Unitarians were really uh, reawakening that kind of heresy. And of course, later on and in our time, the Jehovah's Witnesses pe peddle the same unbiblical falsehood uh, of blasphemy against the Lord of glory our Lord Jesus Christ. So all these things were of great concern to Edmund Calamy, and he bravely, even though the, uh, the wind of heresy was, was swirling around him, uh, his growing congregation, yes, it was a growing congregation in Princess Street, Westminster, uh, and many people flocked to listen to his ministry, and their faith was strengthened. So he had a great influence on keeping people steady uh, while the storm of falsehood was raging. That's the, the situation that we have. So he published uh, those sermons uh, in uh, 1722, sermons on the doctrine of, of, the, of the Trinity. So he then was a great champion for the Lord, and he's to be honored. And it was my privilege to dig into his life and labors and my little booklet, only 48 pages. Uh, from the reviews, uh, I'm encouraged that uh, the message is getting across.
And I do believe that for you, my dear brothers, this evening, that uh, if you were to just dip into this and digest it, uh, it would strengthen your faith for now, as well as his labor strengthened the faith of God's people in the early uh, 18th century. Now let's go on furthermore to uh, examine a little more of what Dr. Edmund Calamy uh, actually taught and what he believed. Uh, what were his, his pastoral priorities? Well, of course, he was a preacher preeminently. He was a preaching pastor before he was an historian. So he had his priority right. He didn't get swept along by academic history uh, as too many are in our own day. They love the history. They love the discussion of documents and the analysis of theories of history without any spiritual involvement. That was never the historical agenda of Edmund Calamy because he was first and foremost a pastor and he was first and foremost a Christian. And he wanted to share the faith, preach the gospel, and to strengthen God's people at that particular time. So he was a Bible man. And I've already mentioned the threat of Roman Catholicism. And uh, he was very courageous in making plain what he thought was the biblical view of the Church of Rome. Uh, he expressed uh, a, a robust uh, Luther-like biblical Protestantism. And uh, I'll give you a quote from one of his sermons from the Sermons on the Scriptures. He says this, If the Scriptures are divinely inspired, the whole foundation of the popish religion is rotten. Our Protestant religion is bottomed upon the Scriptures, which having been given by inspiration of God, cannot deceive us. The Scriptures which came from God and were drawn up under his conduct and influence as a directory to his church and people in all ages are with us a thousand times more venerable and unspeakably more sacred and of greater authority than the doctrines or sentiments of any creatures whatsoever. One little sentence of those divine books, that sentence in particular which declares, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him might not perish but have everlasting life, John 3.16, with us deserves incomparably more respect and regard and all the definitions or determinations, resolutions or decrees of princes or doctors, popes or councils, men or angels. We keep so close to those scriptures, being satisfied of their heavenly original, that our pastors and teachers can safely join in with the great apostle and say, though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Galatians 1.8 And this is our glory. Herein lies the peculiar firmness of our religion and that which distinguishes it from all others, that it came entirely from those scriptures that were divinely inspired. I hope you heard all that. That's Bible-based Christianity. And when at the beginning he said that uh, the popish religion is rotten, uh, this must be made clear that um, uh, a consistent Roman Catholic does not follow Jesus. They follow the Pope. That's why they were called in olden times uh, papists. It wasn't a term of abuse. It was simply a descriptive term because the version of Christianity that they follow is that of the Pope, who has added and undermined the New Testament with doctrines and uh, traditions uh, and so on and so forth ever, ever since. You will not find the true gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Roman Catholic Church. It was true then. It is even more so tonight. But that's another, another story. So that's the important thing for us to, to keep uh, in mind. Dr. Edmund Calamy was emphatically a Bible man. And this is how he tried to present the claims of the Word of God upon our lives and 
upon the lives of pastors. And this is what he said. Let it be your endeavor to get well-furnished minds, warm hearts, governable spirits, tender consciences, and heavenly affections, and that your stability and fruitfulness will be signal. Often reflect on the strength and sacredness of the divine vows you are under, especially regarding baptism and the Lord's Supper, and take care to live faithfully up to them. If you have any regard to the favor of God, the honor of Christ, your own present peace or future happiness. This was from a sermon uh, preached at the ordination of a pastor. And then he went on to show how we must live as Christians. He says, adhere firmly to your doctrine as it is delivered in the Holy Scriptures, which are the true standard which all creeds and confessions, systems and theological tracts and discourses are to be measured by and be ready to maintain and defend it and oppose them that teach any other doctrine. And then he wanted Christian pastors to have fervor in their souls. See, this, there was a great lack of this at this time. Coldness in the pulpit. So Dr. Callamy says, aim at excelling in that love to God, that zeal for Christ, that compassion for the souls of men, that humility of mind, that mastery of your appetites, and that mortification and deadness to this world that becomes the character and profession you have taken upon you. And then sadly, uh, in his day, as in our day, there are examples of moral lapse in the lives of clergy. It's sadly too common in the Western world at this time. It was then. So Calamy says, and he's really taking up the point, well, if you're not living the life of a Christian, can you expect people to listen to what you have to say about the, the Christian faith? He says, men are so disposed that they are much more mind how you live than what you say. And what can be more dreadful than for ministers to pull down and destroy by their bad examples what they seem to take pains to build up with the words of their mouths. In other words, lip and life must be consistent in the life of a minister. This, I believe, is one of the, the challenges for the present time as for them. And of course, no Christian pastor, however faithful he seeks to be, uh, ever reaches the perfection which uh, we ought to possess. And uh, uh, this present lecture uh, sadly, uh, is an example of that. We all have room to grow in grace. So these were the concerns of that particular time. But he did indeed, he, Dr. Edmund Callamy, he, he did lead by example. And that was one of the, the glories of his biography when one, 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 one reads it. So much for his pastoral priorities. Which moves on next to the cry for revival. The state of the churches, the state of society, this east wind of secularism, chilling the souls of men, making the glorious gospel a thing to be argued about rather than proclaimed and experienced. Calamy obviously longed for revival an outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the churches and upon ministers, upon congregations, then for the light of the grace of God to overflow into the society around us. As Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That was the concern of Dr. Edmund Calamy. And so towards the end of his life, this is something of what he was saying. He said, let us beg a fresh effusion of the divine spirit from on high to revive the power 
and life of religion in our midst. Nothing can be more manifest than that the Church of Christ at this day is most sadly degenerated, has long been in a very languishing state, and has become too much like the rest of the world. Formality has eaten out the spirit of piety, and selfishness, covetousness, pride, wrathfulness, envy, and malice have most shamefully abounded in the Christian Church, and sadly defaced, disquieted, and infested it, and all parties have been such sharers in the common guilt that none must pretend an exemption. The great doctrines of the Christian religion have lost their force and are professedly believed but for fashion's sake. And many that make great profession are lost in carnality and are crumbled into parties inflamed against each other, striving which shall get the better, which is much to be lamented. So he, he, he was greatly distressed. I think I would have to say that there was a, almost a constant level of depression on Dr. Calamy's soul. I mean, he, 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 he lived with it and he broke through it in his own personal work, work with the Lord, walk with the Lord. But nonetheless, he, he, he could never shake off uh, the atmosphere of deadness uh, that he complained of in that particular uh, extract. So yes, he, he was desperate for revival, which raises the question for us, doesn't it? What do you think of the church today? The lack of real impact, of real godliness in our nation, which has become so secular, so wicked, so atheistic, banishing God our creator in the name of Darwin and evolution, promoting sexual perversion, homosexuality, LGBTQ, safe-sex marriage, and all these other things which are so commonplace now, so much so that so many of our Christians, even our bishops, are giving way to this kind of pressure. Now, this is the kind, the kind of atmosphere in which Edmund Calamy was living, although the corruptions and perversions of our day have gone way beyond even what he had to uh, lament. Well, time marched on, of course, and his health began to decline. So by the year of 1732, he was on the way to his everlasting rest, to use the language of Richard Baxter's wonderful treatise, The Saints' uh, Everlasting uh, Rest. And uh, Edmund Calamy preached his last sermon at Dr. Williams' library in London. And it was at a meeting of the three denominations, that is the Presbyterians, the Congregationalists, and the Baptists. And uh, in great measure, he was their spokesman uh, to the government and to the, to the authorities. And they all respected him and, and, and honor, honored him. But this was a, is an extract from his last sermon. I can't quote much from it because it's in manuscript at, in Dr. Williams' library. And uh, the, tra the, the extract that I've got was obtained by a 19th century uh, minister. And uh, this is, is what he said. Were I assured this was the last sermon I should ever preach to you, I know not any better text to fasten on than my text, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And to this I can heartily say amen. For, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for you is that you may be saved. And may you but have the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ with you. I shall not doubt of it. May it be on you and in you more and more. May you have it in your homes and in your attendance on God in his house. You will be much in my thoughts, and I trust I shall not be out of yours. So he died on the 9th of June, 1732. He died a peaceful death, resting in the arms of Christ. So ended the earthly life and ministry and labor of Dr. Edmund Calamy. But uh, do I end the story there? Well, not quite. And why not? Well, because 
the very revival that he longed for, in the very year he died, God was at work, and the new dawn was about to break. Calamy died in June 1732. Later that year, George Whitfield entered Pembroke College, Oxford. And it was a little later that he came to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, his ministry is famous. And we thank God for the mighty labors of George Whitfield. But it was all an answer to prayer. The prayers of Edmund Calamy and the godly of his generation. Lord, visit us afresh. Pour out the Holy Spirit. Do great things for your glory and for the salvation of mankind uh, through the preaching, the powerful preaching uh, of, of the gospel. But this is where I have to bring in this third preacher that I mentioned. We mentioned Richard Baxter. I've given you a survey of Dr. Edmund Calamy. And the third one was Dr. Philip Doddridge of, uh, uh, of Northampton. Now, thinking about him, we may say that whilst Calamy was praying for God to begin a great work, it was beginning even whilst he was praying and longing. Because in the autumn of 1729, young Philip Doddridge, who had completed his academy course at Kibworth in Leicestershire, was ordained in Castle Hill Congregational Church, Northampton. And Philip Doddridge had been blessed through Dr. Callamy's edition of the practical works of Richard Baxter. A friend in London, a benefactor in London, had sent these four large volumes to young Philip Doddridge in Leicestershire. And as Doddridge read these books, he said, Baxter is now my particular favorite. And what's interesting, and another link between Doddridge and Calamy, is that when Doddridge was a young man of 16, he went to Dr. Calamy in London and said that he felt a call to the ministry. Uh, please advise me. And after conversation, Dr. Calamy thought this young man was seeking the wrong career. He said, not the ministry for you. Um, take up a, a law profession. Well, Doddridge was not as discouraged as he might have been. The remarkable thing was that um, Calamy was wrong in his assessment of young Philip Doddridge uh, in the merciful providence uh, uh, of, of God. So it's remarkable that, uh, that this, is, this is the case. And so there was this influence, therefore, of Calamy uh, on Philip Doddridge through the works of, of Richard uh, Baxter. So no, Doddridge was not uh, indeed discouraged and he commenced his ministry uh, in autumn 1729. A further interesting link between Calamy and Doddridge is that Calamy's congregation desired Doddridge to be Calamy's successor uh, in 1732. But Doddridge believed that his place was in the Midlands, a strategic choice whereby he could influence uh, Christian churches th throughout the country. And further to underline the, the point that God was answering prayer, just before the dawn of the Methodist revival, uh, something rather wonderful happened in that autumn that Doddridge went to become minister uh, in uh, North Northampton. He preached a sermon called Christ's Invitation to Thirsty Souls. And something remarkable happened in his heart in the pulpit while he was preaching it. And this is what he said. Something of a peculiar blessing seemed to attend the discourse when delivered from the pulpit, and that to such a degree as I do not know to have been equaled in any other sermon I ever preached. Now, he preached a lot of sermons, but he gave a lot of lectures to 
train young men for the ministry in his academy there in Northampton. Now, this was six years before Whitfield's conversion and nine before John Wesley's. Now, remarkably, this sermon of Doddridge was not published until 1748, after which the, after the Methodist revival had become a nationwide phenomenon. George Whitfield bought a copy of it, and he was thrilled by it. And he wrote to Doddridge and said, Dear Sir, I must thank you for your sermon. It contains the very life of preaching. I mean sweet invitations to close with Christ. I do not wonder you are dubbed a Methodist on account of it. So there's a sense in which uh, even before Whitfield started preaching, before the Wesley brothers started preaching, Philip Doddridge was quoting what became um, the staple ministry of the evangelistic uh, labors of the Methodist uh, uh, preachers. So much so that um, Professor Alan Everett, uh, who was at Leicester University, he expressed the opinion that if any event can be regarded as the beginning of the evangelical movement, it is probably the appointment of the independent Philip Doddridge to Castle Hill Chapel in 1729. Now, that, that is rather remarkable. In a sense, therefore, Philip Doddridge, author of hymns like um, A Happy Day That Fixed My Choice on Thee, My Saviour and My God, and Heart the Glad Sound, The Saviour Comes, they breathe the same joy of, as Charles Wesley's hymns. And that really is the spirituality of the New Testament. Holy Spirit anointed, Bible-based truth, touching the lives of the preachers, then touching the lives of those who heard them. Yes, in chapels, but also in open-air gatherings in different parts uh, of uh, the country. So these things are very glorious indeed. Now that sermon that I referred you to earlier, Dr. Edmund Callamy's final sermon uh, the title of it was Gospel Ministers, the Salt of the Earth. Gospel Ministers, the Salt of the Earth. And that was the title that normally uh, preachers and pastors among the Presbyterians and the Congregationalists, the Baptists, uh, they tended to call themselves Gospel Ministers rather than their denominational labels. And I think there's a lot going for that kind of description. And uh, that was the kind of... Uh, emphasis that Calamy had in, in that, his final sermon. Well, I'm going to finish this evening by giving you a little extract of that remarkable sermon by Doddridge, which so impressed George Whitfield. See, you judge for yourself if this is not the kind of ministry that not only was blessed in that time, but also we need today. Doddridge preached in the history of the evangelists, we there find our blessed Redeemer publishing the free and unlimited offers of his grace to all that were willing to accept it. Do you thirst for the pardon of sin? Do you thirst for the favor of God? Do you thirst for the communications of the Spirit? The Lord Jesus can abundantly relieve you. Do you thirst for the joys and glories of the heavenly world? The Lord Jesus Christ is able to relieve you. I know there is a great deal of difference between the common operations of the Spirit on the minds of those who continue obstinate and impenitent and those special influences by which he sweetly but powerfully subdues the hearts of those who are chosen in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. Yet I am persuaded that none to whom the gospel comes are utterly neglected by that sacred agent. Behold then the tears of a redeemer over perishing souls and judge by them of the compassions of his heart. Surely nothing, nothing can be more melting than such tears falling from such eyes and in such circumstances. And if our Lord could not give up the impenitent sinners of Jerusalem without weeping over them, surely he will not despise the humble and penitent soul who is perhaps with tears seeking his favor and flying to his grace as his only refuge. The tears of our blessed Redeemer must needs be convincing and affecting. If the mind be not sunk into an almost incredible stupidity, 
but his blood is still more so. View him, my brethren, not only in the previous scenes of his abasement, his descent from heaven and his abode on earth, but view him on Mount Calvary, extended on the cross, torn with thorns, wounded with nails, pierced with a spear, and then say whether there not be a voice in each of these sacred wounds which loudly proclaims the tenderness of his heart and demonstrates beyond all possibility of dispute or suspicion his readiness to relieve the distressed soul that cries to him for the blessings of the gospel. He died to purchase them, not for himself, but for us. And can it be thought he will be unwilling to bestow them? We may well conclude that he loved us, since he shed his blood to wash us from our sins. That while we were strangers and enemies, he hath died for us. I hope, through grace, there are some such among you who are now thirsting for the blessings of the gospel. To you, my friends, I would briefly say, go directly and plead the case with him, for that soul will surely be relieved, and God in Christ be glorified and exalted. Well, we just sampled. That's just an extract from that sermon by Philip Doddridge. So let us learn and profit from these things and let us, like Calamy and Baxter and Doddridge, long for a mighty outpouring of the Spirit and such a revival as we need in our dark and desperately needy days. Amen.